conducted in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Welcome to Your Money, Your Call. It's a Friday edition of Bonds versus Equities. Joining me on the panel tonight is Sue Wang from Mercer and Nick Bishop from Aberdeen Asset Manage Management. They're here to answer any of your questions on the share or bond market, but pretty much just the bond market. So feel free to pick up the phone call and phone and call us 1300 30 34 35. The email is your money at skynews.com.au. Welcome again. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start with you, Sue. How's business? You've been on a short holiday, you've come back, flat chat. Oh, short holiday, relaxation is all gone oh. after one day, a um, thousand emails. Look, consulting is busy, clients are, um, are demanding more and more, market volatility, you know, all that sort of stuff yep. isn't helping, but at the same time, you know, keeping them happy is important. And, and so that what are they demanding of you in, in respect, without talking to the specifics of those guys, but is there a theme around what they're looking for at the moment? Is there, is there a sense that we need to get our um, a, a end of year review? Is that the sort of way they look at it? Is it a calendar thing or is it more about what market forces are doing and making them a little bit more keen to get some feedback? It's less to do with a calendar thing because different clients will sort of look at reviews at different times in the year, but mainly about we've seen a, a reasonably um, large rise in bond yields around the world. Yeah. Um, the clear direction in the medium term is still up uh, and clients are just looking at adjusting their portfolio to, to make sure they're protected against that further rise in yield. How about you, Matt? How has business been with you? Good. Uh, and echoing the themes that Sue mentioned, actually. So we've seen uh, uh, increasing interest in some of the strategies that can benefit from just the environment that Sue was describing. And we would share that belief as well that in the medium term, uh, uh, you're, you're looking at a rising so environment. Home, what's medium term? Is it is it a week or is medium term oh, no, like no, no. two years? You know, what, what are we talking about in medium term? Yeah, I mean, our, our investment horizon is a 12-month horizon. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but when we're talking medium term, we're thinking a usual uh, a business cycle, uh, yep. in essence. So our forecast horizon, our investment horizon is 12 months, um, which I guess to us would be medium term, but anywhere between 12 months and two to three years, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. A, year, a, year, a year to three years tends to yep. be, I guess, our definition. Yeah. And, and if I was to understand some of the benchmarks that your your investors would be looking for, what sort of benchmarks would they have for you, Nick? What's a, it, and it might move around for different ones, but broadly speaking, what's the benchmark? Sure. So it varies per client, So, and, and Sue will know this very well. So some clients say to us, look, I have a defined set of liabilities that I need you to manage against. My benchmark won't change, regardless of what yields are doing. As an example, uh, it would be... An insurance super, company uh, okay. with a closed book of insurance business, yep. for example, or with a long-dated annuity book that we will invest to provide the income for. Yep. So they won't really change too much. Now, on the other hand, we have some much more dynamic investors who are quite active in engaging us and saying, well, look, I, I also foresee rising bond yields. What can I do to alter my mandate with, with you guys? What do you recommend so that we can either protect ourselves or avoid the worst implications of rising yields? So some of the strongest in interests we've seen from our existing clients and, uh, and, and some new money has been in more total return oriented strategies. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, that, that could be something like a floating rate income fund or something that's a little bit more aggressive, a total return fixed income fund looking to insulate you from uh, rises in bond yields and actually benefit from that market environment. So, so with the with with that in mind, mm. is that what you're seeing from your clients Definitely. in terms of what what are their benchmarks? Same sort of thing. I've got liabilities around uh, pension entitlements. Is that the sort of thing they'd come to you and say, "Look, I'm an industry super fund. People are retiring. I can see it from uh, the actuarial uh, expectations. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to pe spend you know five hundred dollars a week per person." I think the insurance out. client group is a unique group and they're the ones that have a very defined mm. duration and, um, and liability profile. For the most part, um, our super funds are a, a little bit more dynamic and there are some fairly entrenched benchmarks and they're typically you know, cap-weighted benchmarks. But with cap-weighted benchmarks comes a certain amount of duration, interest rate risk basically. And in a rising yield environment, exactly what Nick's saying is happening. Clients are saying,
saying, well, I want to do something to my portfolio. If it means changing my benchmark, so be it, to insulate me from that interest rate risk. We're seeing a lot more what we're calling absolute return styles or a more sexier version is the total return style, as well as a movement into shorter duration credit portfolios, floating rate credit portfolios yeah. as well. Okay. Uh, we've got a caller, Dan from Perth. You'd like to talk to us about a hybrid, I believe. Dan, how can we help you? Oh, hi, Mark. Thanks very much for the show. I really enjoy this uh, Bonds edition. Oh, good. And I've learned a lot about it since I've started listening to it and watching it. Um, okay. I wanted to ask tonight about um, MXUPA, the Multiplex Hybrid Security. Yep. Uh, they were issued at, uh, a long time ago at a face value of $100. I believe they pay 3.9% plus the six-month bank bill rate. Yep. Uh, on the face value, but they're now trading at about $83.89. I just want to ask what your thoughts are about MXUPAs. Are they investment grade? And also, is it something suitable for me? I turn 30 next year. Is this something suitable for me to be looking at? Thanks. Great. Um, it's always challenging to talk about specific um, hybrids because of the different roles they play. Essentially, common sense tells me that anything goes out at 100, it's now at 89. There's you know, the market will tell you there's a reason for that and therefore you need to be conscious of the fact that you're taking on far greater risk. Um, I don't want to talk specifically about Multiplex because it becomes um, an opinion that I, I'm not really privy to try and provide. But one thing I would be comfortable in saying is that somebody at 30 can have a greater risk tolerance in terms of duration, in terms of how long you could be invested for. But at the same time, I think if you're looking at some of your earlier assets, earlier investments, it's a challenge to understand why anyone would start with a multiplex. That's that's sort of, with all the bank hybrids that are around at the moment and some of the, the value that those sort of um, assets are producing, I would imagine you could start there. But the easiest thing, the first thing you should do is um, get an advice. You can call anyone at, at uh, FIG and they'll give you some advice around what we call the relative value. So we'll look at multiplex and compare the other hybrids and then some of the over-the-counters and, and we'd make some um, recommendations on that basis. Having got to know you a little bit better. Uh, any thoughts on multiplex? You know, is there anything that you'd be... Have I said anything wrong? No, I think like basically there's no free lunch. So yeah. there's, there's a, probably a good reason why it's pricing so you can be away. Brutal in some of these commentaries here. <laughs> Um, There's probably a right. good reason why it's pricing the way it is. Yeah. It may still suit your um, financial circumstances, but you probably need to talk to someone. Yeah, and it's like, it was the same with some of the NAB hybrids that absolutely got knocked down into the 70s. Mm -hmm. And and so we had um, people who are professionals coming back saying, I've got a market view on some of these hybrids. I'm taking that risk. But for people who are just looking to get income securities, mm. th it's, it's playing a different role. You know, an income security in the form of the hybrid uh, should be trading at par, there or thereabouts, mm -hmm. and it should be something you're very comfortable with just to take the income, okay. in, in our view. Um, the the strategies that we've talked about, we've talked about the fact that it's going some floating. The one thing I wanted to ask you about was the idea that uh, we're about to hit taper, and we can talk about taper later, but in June of this year, everything was, if I looked bond and bubble, they were all in one sentence, as I could find them everywhere. It was, you know, if you Google search bond bubble, it would go forever. Uh, are clients giving you more money? Are people moving into equities? I, you know, I've got some various reports saying everyone's buying equities. How, how's the inflows looking? Um, certainly there's been talk, but I can't say the numbers stack up. Yeah. I haven't seen that widespread move out of bonds into equities. Yeah, right. uh, and so, look, it may, it may be something that we could happen next year, but yeah. I haven't seen it happen yet. And, and how about you? Yeah, I think um, one thing we, I mean, our FUM is, is, is certainly stable, so there's, there's not too much coming there. I think the, the, the direction of flows in terms of the products that they're looking at, which goes to the point we made before, yeah. is more important. So I think that investors are conscious that we're in a medium term rising yield environment. How do I, uh, um, you know, how do I still take advantage of fixed income strategies, but not expose myself to the potential of, of much higher yields? Um, bear in mind as well that equity indices have run extremely hard. If you you look at the degree of the recovery in bond yields post the June taper scare yeah. compared to how hard equities have run, the, the equity retracement is about 150% um, of the sell-off, whereas yeah. in bonds um, you're nowhere near recouping the, the, the move in yields. Yeah. So I think you could argue there's a little bit more froth and optimism in the equity market. Of course I say that I'm a bond guy yeah, all the yeah, time, but um, you, could, you could make a case to say that equities look a little bit more stretched than bonds. So I think that is one thing that's holding back particularly large institutions mm -hmm. from piling in wholesale to, to the equity market. Do you feel, Sue, that around the, the, uh, the, the water cooler conversations, because mm. you'll have 
at Mercy you'll have people who are equities fixed yes. income. Uh, without, again, I'm very conscious of the fact that you can't say anything that's out, outward that, that would be in, 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 indiscriminate in terms of the, the statement, but, but is the view within, a, I get the view that a lot of the equity guys are going, wow, you know, wow, this is really high. This is, we had Roger last week, Roger Montgomery saying, I just can't see any value. And everyone I've had, um, whether it be Ords, Francesca was on, mm -hmm. they're all saying, it feels fully valued. Mm -hmm. it, it feels it. So I, I, the only people who seem to want to have to buy it are people who are tagging, fo following an index. Is that yep. your sense of it? That everyone's going, mm -hmm. I need to see something else to make that value. You know, those we have these discussions up. exactly as I say at the water cooler and any avenue every day and I sit literally like this distance from our equity um, specialist and I think the general consensus is there's a, there's a momentum to want to move there yeah. but they're being held back because everything looks fully priced at the moment and everyone's just waiting for that small little buying opportunity to come in yeah. whether that's a bit, a bit more negative data out of the US just to um, pull the equity market back a little bit to provide a better entry point I certainly think most people think now is not the most fantastic entry point. I, I did a, uh, a seminar um, in the country yesterday and um, it was 30, 40 people and I, I asked the question, I said who's, who's now buying in the market or who's looking to take some, some money off? The people who take money off show of hands. Man, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's saying I want to take some money, I want to bank some money because mm -hmm. I remember the GFC and the volatility of that GFC. Mm -hmm. um, we will talk more about tapering after the break but we'll leave it there, we'll have to go to a very quick break uh, and We'll be back to you in very short 30 seconds. I'm sure it'll be very short. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Fig Securities, and joining me tonight on the show is Sue Wang from Mercer and Nick Bishop, who is with Aberdeen Asset Management. They're here to answer any of your questions, so feel free to give us a call on 1300 30 34 35. And the email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Uh, let's talk about tapering. Um, when do you think it'll happen? And, uh, and the idea of it being orderly or disorderly, uh, if I can start with you. So what, what, sure. what's your expectations if oh, you've got geez, any? I formed them just in the last day given I've been away. But it yep. seems like market consensus is around March at the earliest yep. um, and possibly April is, is where people are timing it. Well, I, do I think it'll be orderly? Um, it depends what you mean by orderly. If it's well telegraphed, as I think will be Yellen's style, because she will be in by the time it starts, um, then I think it most likely will be orderly. Will yep. it cause volatility? Almost certainly. There should be some volatility, certainly in emerging markets, as we've seen already, yep. possibly less so in developed markets. Okay, and your thoughts, Wayne? Uh, in some respects, we agree. In some respects, we don't. But that's, oh, what, that's what makes uh, the market fantastic. Okay. So that's good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, our, our, to us, more interesting is when does it end? Mm. And I think you can debate, you know, when whether it's a January, a, a March, or what have you. And I think that to to a, to a relatively short-term focused investor, that's that's probably more interesting. As I said earlier on in the show, we have a 12-month sort of medium-term focus. Yeah. Um, so we think it will be fully complete in the 12 month time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, do we think that can be orderly? No, we don't. I think you had a, a little window into the world of QE removal in June, mm -hmm. uh, and that was the mere suggestion that yep. it could begin. There was a misstep, there was clearly begin, a misstep. Hadn't, yeah. It hadn't even begun. Now, <clears throat> that was a 180 degree turnaround in market sentiment, arguably, from May through to June, where most people in the market believed there was, I mean, there was even that talk of QE infinity, yep. if you remember that yep. phrase. I thought I phrased that, but anyway, yeah. Uh, it may not be trademarked. Um, Mark Todd, try but, and get it. Um, but but that was a very violent shift in market sentiment. Yeah. So it has, as you say, so it's been probably better telegraphed this time round. But the idea that you can remove uh, such colossal stimulus mm -hmm. in an orderly fashion, uh, even if you have fantastic communication skills and, yeah. and, and and forward guidance, we think is a bit is a bit misguided. Is that one of the things you think about Yellen that she's a very good communicator? Is that is that something that's uh, been instrumental in part of the decision making process because if you look at Summers mm. different communication skills mm, mm, mm. He's, he's you know head on through um, is that something that you think she is good at uh, it 
Certainly she has been a, an advocate for clear communication from central banks. So she's very much been um, a supporter of forward guidance. That is certainly something that she feels very strongly about, that, that central banks have a role or can have a role in controlling monetary policy further out of the yield curve by clear communication, so a, a clear advocate there. Um, but she's also, she's been painted as a dove, and for anyone who's not used to financial yeah, jargon, the, the a dove means rates. someone who is uh, uh, typically more downbeat on an economy and will tend to favour lots of stimulus, yep. rather than what we call a hawk, which is someone who tends to see more inflationary risks and wants to be reigning, you know, reigning back so stimulus. So Fisher, Fisher the, the, the guy from the the Texas, hawk, uh, yeah, so for the Dallas Fed home, president, uh, he is the uh, Texas uh, Fed chairman and uh, he has an Australian link. He was here last week he was. Uh, mm -hmm. doing some speeches and he is an arch hawk. He would make some, uh, by Texan standards, some, some modest comments by the rest of the world. It's quite, uh, you know, outlandish mm -hmm. statements. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a very interesting guy. And he's, he's one within the Fed who is saying, you know, put the brakes on. We, this, is, this is not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what we have to remember, and sorry, uh, just a final point, what we have to remember is that, you know, quantitative easing is a setting that is there for a crisis. Yep. It's for a crisis style economy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're up to probably by the time it's finished, QE3 will be about 1.6 trillion. QE1 was about 1.4 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the time QE3 is finished, the Fed's balance sheet will be about 35% of the US economy, which mm -hmm. is worth 13 trillion roughly a year. Massive numbers. 13 trillion. 13 trillion in the US economy. The Australian economy is about 1 trillion. This is GDP. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm you know, annual output in yeah. like everything, all the stuff Australia produces and sells is, one. is about yeah, a trillion, the US is about 13. So um, these settings are absolutely exceptional in nature and they're designed to stave off, you know, multi-decade uh, downturns in economies. The US economy is not going gangbusters by any stretch of the imagination, but is it in crisis mode? Absolutely not. So we think QE is very unpalatable at the political level, mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is the Fed has backed themselves into it now. How do you back yourself out of that? There was no exit plan when QE was, was, started. was started. 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 It was a, an experiment. It remains an experiment. Um, uh, and so in part, we, we, we expect it, the chances mm -hmm. of it ending smoothly are isn't it interesting limited. because of when it started there'll be people who will be working in the markets for five years will not know anything other than QE. Mm. You know, they'll just be assuming that there's this free cash that mm. they can go and cheap get. Cheap money. Mm. This cheap money mm. that, that is always looking for a home for higher assets because they've, they've bought all these assets. And so when you talk about the normalisation of the, of the credit curve, of the interest rates, mm -hmm. they won't know it. They won't know what that well, looks similarly, like. Well similarly, I mean like if we I'll quickly just sort of um, recap on, on Yellen. There are many people in the market who've never ever um, been around during a time when the Fed wasn't communicative. Yeah, right. So you've had um, sort of grand, Greenspan started, started all with let's just make sure the market is reasonably aware of our thoughts and our processes. Bernanke is clearly of that mode too and we think Yellen's even more yep. um, communicative. And I think um, back to I guess the dovish comment you made Nick, the lady has made it very clear she is foremost supportive of maximum employment in the US. Yep. She will probably forego some inflation pressure mm. to try and achieve both growth in employment and just plain old GDP growth. And where's maximum? Is it at 6% or is it like we have with the 5 or, or is it, you know, where, where does, I know they say 6 and 3 quarters but that comes down to the participation component as yeah. well. Um, you know, there's a school of thought that the maximum employment does, isn't going to work purely because the ageing demographics. There's more people out of work because they're just retiring. Um, where do you think the number is? Suffice to say, I'd say it's certainly lower than what it is now. Yep. She's very unhappy with the current number. Yep. Um, and we're um, unlikely to have made her feel that tapering should start this year with the numbers. I mean, like it is Tardy payrolls night tonight, so we, mm -hmm. we could get a beautiful big number. Uh, but look, the consensus is only 133,000. Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that doesn't even account for ageing. You know, people coming into the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, we have to go for another very short break, but please feel free to call us on 1300 30 34 35 for any questions you have on investing. The email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Fig Security Securities. Joining me tonight is Sue Wang from Mercer and Nick Bishop, and he's from Aberdeen Asset Management. They're here to answer any of your questions on 1300 30 34 35, and the email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Uh, we were talking about, prior to the break, um, tapering, you know, but, but, you know, Japan, 
you know, we were talking in the break about Japan is doing the, the QE, and and do you want to talk, Nick, about the the, the volume? Like Sue was mentioning, is massive. So, mm. have you got the numbers at hand that you think it's going to be? Yeah. So when I mean, what the Bank of Japan said that they were going to be doing is trying to double the monetary base over two years mm. to target two percent inflation. Now, from our conversations with Japanese, uh, large Japanese investors, they don't believe 2% inflation is achievable, but the very fact they have more confidence in 1% being achievable yeah. rather than inflation going down, you know, Deflation. speaks volumes. Um, and so it's a very big program, but you see, the impact on the Japanese bond market has been virtually zero. So the, the least, the, you know, Japanese government bonds are the least volatile government bonds in the world, despite the fact you have over 200% debt to GDP. So it's the most heavily indebted developed market sovereign, and yet the bond yields do very little. They simply don't respond why to these metrics. That? Now, why is that? Partly because the Bank of Japan controls, so owns and, and essentially buys mm -hmm. so much of the bond market, and the domestic banks acting as something of a cabal, also have a vested interest in keeping bond yields down because so much of their balance sheets are comprised of JGBs. Yeah. So rising government bond yields in Japan would hurt them. Would hurt them. Uh, so the it's a very, sure. yeah, certain, certain strategists call the market the widow maker for developed market bond participants yeah. like ourselves. So trying to make money from selling Japanese government bonds, expecting yields to go higher, is known as the widow maker. You can have a go, but they right. they've barely moved. Many so, a JJB trader has been, you know, uh, yeah, has, has evaporated. Has evaporated. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's 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 that's a market where it's very difficult to join the dots between what you think fundamentals are doing and what market pricing is telling you. Um, and uh, what about you, the, the Japan scenario? What, what's your thoughts on all this? I think it's actually exciting that for the first time there is a prospect of at least not negative yep. inflation. Um, I agree, I think the 2% target is extremely ambitious, but simply getting somewhere close mm. to a positive one is, I think, like I said, um, exciting and interesting. We'll see how they go. They, like I said, as Nick says, they have a large vested interest in keeping those bond yields. They own a lot of their own bonds. So, so we've got some structural problems in Japan. They're aging rapidly. They, mm -hmm. you know, jet, debt to GDP is, is far too high. They need to make some changes around how to get their economy outward looking and all that sort of stuff. And then we go to Europe. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts there? Oh, Europe. So you had ECB um, surprise last night with um, yeah. coming out and um, cu cutting the refinancing rate. Nick and I, as we were chatting um, in the break, both were not surprised. Um, Europe, in many ways, is still a basket case. Uh, inflation has just taken a massive tumble. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're trying to say that this isn't quite the Japanese scenario, but deep down they're worried this is turning into a Japanese yeah. scenario. So the cut, to me, certainly was not a surprise. And the, the, um, the level of unemployment. Oh. Mm. I mean, do you want to tell the viewers at home what sort of numbers you're seeing uh, in Spain? So, yeah. so, so recently, euro-wide unemployment recently mm. rose to 12.2%, but you've got to bear in mind that in Germany it's, you know, four. Uh, uh, no, five point odd. Five, five yeah. percent-ish. Ish. Yeah. Full, so, full employment there, yeah. basically. Yeah. So um, in, in countries like Spain, Spain, you're up into the high 20s for mm -hmm. unemployment, youth unemployment over 50% yes. in Spain, in Greece, and so on. Now. In, in the southern economies in Europe, structurally there has always been higher unemployment, but the, 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 uh, the level today, you're essentially seeing a generation that is being locked out of the labour market. Okay. I mean, clearly there's, that, that's the problem. There's the generational change. Because if the, if the Germans came in and say, this is what the new Europe, the unified Europe would look like, there are people who just aren't even going to come close to that. You know, being involved in that, in that mm. job process because mm. it's just, you know, they can't get to any jobs, they can't get to the travel, they can't do it. Um, we will talk more about Europe, but we have to go to another very short break. Please feel free to call us on 1300 30 34 35 for any questions you might have or email your money, skynews.com.au, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Fixed Securities. Joining me tonight on the program is Sue Wang from Mercer and Nick Bishop from Aberdeen Asset Management. They're here to answer any of your questions you might have, so feel free to pick up the phone on 1300 30 34 35 and the email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Uh, bonds versus equities, we will have some equity conversations <laughs> soon, but um, we were talking about Europe and I saw that France has been downgraded, it's gone from double A plus to double A. 
Is that significant? I mean, I know the states went, so is that an important event? Nick, what's your thoughts as an investor in you know, sovereigns? You'll have sovereigns? Yeah, we, we think it is significant. Um, and the bond market also took notice too. So just before we left, we had a quick look and, and yields were certainly higher in France, um, about 0.15%. Uh, is that super dramatic for, for viewers at home? No, it's not a cataclysm, but it, it is a clear message that France is now perceived as a weaker credit than it was prior, prior to the news. So it was a little bit of a surprise. Now, interestingly, uh, it's quite convenient for me because one of the positions we have in portfolios at the moment is a short or an underweight French government bonds and an overweight to German government bonds yep. for, all, for all our clients that permit those uh, strategies. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, for some months that position has not been going so well. Right. Um, but certainly, we're we're seeing some of the fundamental reasons why that position is in portfolios are coming to fruition. And so France is a fundamentally weaker credit than uh, than so its yields would suggest. So, so what, what we're hearing is the strategy that Nick and for the viewers at home, what Nick is saying, he's selling the French. Is that what you're in? You're, you're selling yep. French bonds. So he's going out and using um, some sophisticated tools to get short. That's what it's called, selling that. And then he's buying the Germans. Gee. Culturally challenging here for Nick, but um, as being an Englishman, uh, so he sells the French buys to German, and that didn't work out. But now that's starting to uh, work in your favour. So French is, is going higher. Why didn't you like the French? Is it because of the way? Is it the fiscal story around the French and about how they haven't embraced the austerity and they try to do the uh, let's all get together? What was uh, it? Like? It's it, it's. L elements of those reasons. So essentially France has a problem where they have not embraced the structural reforms that would improve some of their demographics, improve some of the, the social level of social security payments, the pension payments, yep. um, the labour market is not flexible at all. So mm -hmm. you'll have heard before that there's a mandatory 35 hour working week in France. I can't remember the last time I worked 35 hours in a week. Uh, I think I was about 18, but um, that means it's very difficult for employers to get more out of their workforce. Yeah. Uh, and so you have some structural impediments to that economy displaying the kind of dynamism that somewhere like the US does. You've got a very unpopular Prime Minister in, in Hollande, President, beg your pardon, in uh, Francois Hollande. Yeah. Um, record low approval ratings now. Uh, and and they're, they're just not extricating themselves from their debt uh, problem. The, the growth has been insufficient, uh, unemployment is rising, it's risen far more than, uh, uh, than, than a supposedly core European country should have done, uh, and yet it benefits from being perceived as certainly is too big to fail yeah. uh, and as being you know still one of the the core countries but we we don't we don't believe that's really the case and is the is the french government looking to embrace some change having seen this shock is that do you think that'll come back because yolande he he uh you know he's got it wrong everywhere he's looked you know he seems to have made a lot of missteps uh, yeah i think i think the, the challenge is that you have a lack of institutional willingness to, to push through hard decisions and with a weakened, a greatly weakened president that will only mm -hmm. be exaggerated. Yeah. Um, so, so look, I mean, we've got to remember that markets in general at the moment are being soothed by actions like the ECB rate cut by the belief that uh, tapering from, from the Federal Reserve is some way off. So. I wouldn't want to overstate the degree to which this could unsettle markets, but we think it is an interesting uh, uh, development. It reminds you, as you said, Sue, that all is not uh, plain sailing for Europe still. So, so when I talk to you know, our investors, I mean, the, the FIG model is to have direct investment, and the self-managed super fund is the fastest growing segment segment in the in the marketplace for investors. So we really like that. That that clearly is about education, talking to clients. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, post the GFC, uh, all the advisors were thrown out, you know, baby with the bathwater. It was all no advisors. So one of the things I, I often ask the guests that I have to come on is to articulate the value add. This seems to be a case, you know, for and and that's what you would. All, that's your job, really, isn't looking at what the value add. This sort of makes sense, isn't it, to to see where the value add is that self managed super fund people can't access. Sure, I guess um, uh, for viewers who, who don't know, my job is very much to meet people like Nick and, and his um, you know uh, portfolio manager team and decide whether I think that they're adding value. And I guess by that I, I'm working out are their ideas and are their strategies um, going to deliver you. Uh, some alpha, some outperformance. And I think that's a call like that, the let's go short France, long Germany, that's very much based off, I guess, your view that it's being treated like a core country, but it doesn't really behave like one. It certainly doesn't have the structural flexibility, mm. as you said, to be like one. And so while the rest of the market is pricing it like 
a call. Our decision is we don't think it is, and hence we're not going to buy into that story. Um, and, and you know, this week it's, it's definitely worked for you. And I think that's what we're looking for in managers to to not price with the market and just yep. to um, look for valuations. Be dynamic and thinking. Be dynamic, definitely. Um, we're going to bring some of the uh, the equity world back to the table, and uh, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about was the the and I want to start with you, Sue, about the idea that the, the Telstra and the banks are the new bonds, and I. We were talking about last week how it's changing some of the behaviour of the corporates. You know, Rio, you know, BHP are all trying to provide dividends because that's what they should do, where in reality they should probably keep some capital and try and find growth assets. Growth assets are what they are. Their equities are equities. They're supposed to be growth assets in your uh, portfolio. But but when, when you see all this pressure on bank dividends and the idea that APRA is talking about it and Telstra is a new bond, how, how do you respond to that? What do you think of that? I guess... Um, it's not entirely surprising that following some pretty attractive results from all four um, yep. majors that they would use that opportunity to come out to market an issue yep. and very well received uh, two to three times oversubscribed and fairly tight margins um, I guess at the end of the day I'm still relying on fund managers and, and, and portfolio managers like, like Nick here to decide whether they fit the needs of individual client portfolios uh, it may be totally necessary for yep. an insurance client to be buying up as much of this as possible because in a lot of their portfolios they can only buy Australian assets, predominantly Australian yep. bonds, and they've got to take up as much issuance as they can. For a more dynamic, risk-seeking client, I'd say there are probably better opportunities offshore. Nick, your thoughts? Yeah, look, it's um, something we've seen for some time now has been the, the, um, the use of large cap equities in Australia as bond-like investments for the high dividend yields. So, you know, you look at uh, uh, you know a bank today, or even Telstra. You're in the high seven percent for your mm -hmm. for your dividend, gross dividend yield, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously you have to consider Frankie as well. But call it the high seven percent. Now, um, as long as the capital value is stable, then that looks like quite a nice bond-like investment. But it comes back to that capital stable mm -hmm. point. Now, I would argue that if you look at the price to book for CBA at two point eight times. Uh, Aussie banks look on a global basis really expensive. Yeah. Uh, look at a bank like Wells Fargo, 1.3 times book. JP Morgan, one times book. What is it about Australia where supposedly the banks make over the twice market. the profit per customer than you do from a, a large US bank? So, so, that, so that, that's the challenge, that's the risk is that whilst your income looks great, if you ignore the capital element to an equity, then you, you could be in for a so surprise if that adjusts. We're about to go to a break in a couple of minutes, so we'll talk very quickly about a chart you brought brought to the mm. show. Mm. Um, and, and Carrington, if you could put up that chart about uh, the difference between the equity and the bond performance and, and the ideas that we want to talk about with the uh, dreaded Lehmans. Mm. So, so Nick, you've got a chart here that highlights what's happening in the equity. Yeah, so, so we're not saying any of the Australian majors are going to do this, but, but no. you, the point is... No, so, so this chart is the Lehman Brothers stock price compared to the Lehman Brothers bond price. Yep. And around the time, obviously, heading, I mean, the dates are on, the, the dates are on there. You can yep. see heading into the maelstrom that changed, uh, yeah, probably changed world. our lives forever. Now, the point of this chart is that for a credit investor or a bond investor, you have a very different return profile to an equity investor. And that changes the way that you need to approach the investment. So for a, a, a bond investor, if I, if I buy, say, CBA bonds at a 7% yield and I get that right, what's my return? 7%. Yep. It can't get any better than that. That's where I bought it, that's the yield I'll get. So that's my upside, call it 7%. If I get that bet wrong, and heaven forbid CBA turned into the Lehman Brothers, I could lose everything, as that chart right, shows. That. So you have a really asymmetric skew to your potential uh, uh, returns, yeah. whereas equity returns are a lot more evenly distributed. I could make 20%, I could lose 20%. So what, you might say? Well, what it means is that when you're investing in bonds, you need diversification because just one of those Lehman-type episodes will undo all of that steady income that you get from all of your other investments. That's so right. you need to be very careful about which companies you lend to and you need a diversified spread of assets. One, two, three bonds, you're kidding yourself if you have an efficient diversified portfolio of credits. We're talking 80, 100. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, um, we have to leave it there. We'll go to another very quick break and we're straight back talking about 80, 100 or 3. Talk to you soon. Welcome back to the Friday edition of Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Fixed Securities and joining me tonight on the show 
is Sue Wang, who is with Mercer, and Nick Bishop, who is from Aberdeen Asset Management. They're here to answer any of your questions, so feel free to pick up the phone or email us. The phone number, 1300 30 3435, and the email is your money at skynews.com.au. I think, uh, Sue, so I just want to bring you into the conversation around interest rates, because one of the things that has been interesting is turn deposits, you talk to the investors, it, it's just low, low, low. Where am I getting my return that I traditionally had used? Um, what is the Mercer view on interest rates in Australia at first? You know, what's the thoughts for the medium term? Oh, geez, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about the Mercer view. I certainly have some, some okay, personal your view. views. Um, I guess fairly quickly... This is not the Mercer view, this is just something that works there. <laughs> Um, fairly quickly, the markets decided that this is probably the end of the um, easing cycle. Yep. I personally think there might be still one more in it uh, yep. sometime next year. Uh, I guess case in point, um, employment numbers that, that came out sort of early in the week were, to my mind, pretty disappointing. Uh, no change in the unemployment rate, uh, no change in the participation rate. But if you make up of the uh, full-time and the part-time, was very, very, very drastic. You've got big surge in part-time, kind of expected this time of year, um, and a massive reduction in full-time, like almost $30,000 uh, 30, jobs lost in the full-time. Really? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I still think that the, um, you know, the, uh, that is certain would be weighing on the RBA's mind. Employment yep. is, is, is not looking good. Um, if anything, it's, it's softening possibly faster than they thought. Are you, are you surprised by that? I mean, I think when the change in government came through, if I had have taken the, the, the financial review for that week, the numbers of times it said productivity in every article, every commentary, everything was about productivity. You would have thought that, that, that and that's all code for job losses. And you, you go to see everyone about thinking there's an IR change that'll take place in terms of loading and, and all that sort of stuff. So is that surprising to you? Because there was a heightened level of confidence in the business sector, mm -hmm. but I felt that was because they thought there'll be some changes around the employment sector that they could become more pro productive. Is, is that how you read it? Um, even if we do see that sort of change in regulation to, you know, to assist in productivity, I think it's a slow burn yeah. thing. And in the short term, the market is definitely softening rather the, than... Wh why would it be... Why do you think it's softening? What's, what's driving the Australian economy at the moment? Is it just that we are stuck with the mining world sort of decelerating? You know, the, con the construction piece is, is not in productive work. No. Um, like it's the same story that's been happening all year long. The mining piece is not chugging along yeah. as, fa as fast as it was, and all the other pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are not lifting their game enough. Yeah. And that's, I think that that's a story we'll see through most of next year as well. Is that your interpretation on the cash rates, Nick? Um, we are not quite... I mean, our, our view is that we'll have an unchanged cash rate over the next 12 months, but we do share a lot of the sentiment that Sue has expressed there. Um, our view of the employment rate, unemployment rate, is, is a, a bit of a backward-looking indicator. Yep. So it certainly tells you what was happening a few quarters ago that led to those job cut decisions. Mm -hmm. Some of the leading indicators that we look at, uh, so business confidence yep. rather than current business conditions, has, has risen quite sharply, which is encouraging. Um, the housing market... Can you drill down into that, though, and tell me what you think is driving that confidence? Have they done another... Uh, you know, I see, to see the an confidence extent, number. Uh, there's been some interesting research from some of the major banks. To an extent, the greatest increases in confidence were with those liberal voters, <laughs> actually. When you break it down by voting intentions, really? the biggest yeah. increase in confidence. We're in. We're back home. So, so to an extent, that's a post-election boost. We need to see a few more data points to determine whether that's sustainable. So yep. cautious optimism there. Yep. Um, the housing market recovery is significant. We don't think it should be overlooked. At the moment, the challenge there, though, for the RBA is that uh, the biggest improvement has been in the investor segment. So first-time buyers and first homeowners who would typically buy a newly built home are you know, flatlining for all and, intents and, and purposes. And that's so. the problem with the with what the RBA is seeing, isn't it, Sue? It's, it's the fact that it's people just bidding up Dutch options are just going higher mm -hmm. and it's not actually having new homes mm. for people who are getting into the market and then creating jobs for plumbers, you know. It's the, not the translating into any building activity, which has been highly disappointing for them. Yep. All it's translating into is a, a fairly vicious cycle of existing homes being bid, um, bid up, basically. Yep. So then, what's the driver in the economic cycle? What, what can you imagine might be coming down the, 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 the pipeline that'll move in other words, you're saying cash rates don't move. I get that. So what do you think? Is it the currency, trying to get the currency to move? Is that the key to it all? To get the economy moving forward? The di dynamic... Help. 
certainly would help. Would I, help. I, think, I think the RBA is very frustrated with the currency. I think the statement of monetary policy, the recent statement of monetary policy, shows that, but the RBA is not a bank who defends or proactively looks to get involved Engages in its it. currency. Uh, I think partly the wording in the statement of monetary policy is their attempt to what we call jawbone the currency yep. down, but uh, the, the biggest step change in the currency we think will occur when uh, US uh, you know, tapering, tapering and, and the, the confidence in US growth uh, gives a further fillip to the dollar, like we saw. I mean, if you remember, in you know, June. The Aussie, June, I mean, the, I was travelling at the time and we were very, uh, the family and I were very happy at the start of our holiday yeah, with disaster. 108 or so. By the time we came home, we were thinking, well, do we really need that second cup of tea or can we? I, I can actually. Manage? So I think, you know, the, the currency will be important, but the problem is it's not within. The RBA's remit to control that, so they're a little bit of a hostage. Um, I, what, look, I what, know where to put it down to. Yeah. My wife booked a Christmas holiday in the States, and as soon as that happened, the currency just right. got belted. Leading, I mean, leading indicator. Leading indicator. Oh, absolutely. You should have checked your yeah. credit card. Absolutely. Yeah. Toddy's holiday plans. That's right. The, the um, but the the St Governor Stevens said we cannot do anything. We are flotsam. We cannot do anything about this. And he just looked and said, "I want them to taper," didn't he? Because that, that's where. You know, essentially their interest rates will move closer to our interest rates, and mm. he found it hard to imagine mm. moving our interest rates below two and a half. And that's a uh, that's an intellectual problem they've got right now. They just can't imagine going further, mm. only because I, I guess the housing market will go off the Richter scale. Up. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, one point to make though is that when you think about how much stimulus there has already been from the cash rates we've had, there's, that's a big cash flow impact to Australian households. There's sure. a lot more cash flow flowing through the, the coffers each month now. Yeah. Um, it's time for another very quick break. We'll be back in just a moment. We'll talk to you soon. Welcome back to the Friday edition of Your Money, Your Call. It's Bonds versus Equities, and I'm Mark Todd. And joining me tonight on the show is Sue Wayne from Mercer and Nick Bishop from Aberdeen Asset Management. They're here to answer any of your questions and calls, and we have a caller in. Um, Eric from Sydney. Eric, how can we help you? Thanks very much, Mark. Look, uh, my question is, with quantitative easing, if it does finish, I mean, you can track quantitative easing with the demise of interest rates in Australia for the depositor. I mean, Australian banks import currency or this cheap money into Australia, of course, and I mean, when this finishes and these foreigners want their money back, what is going to happen, one, to uh, the Australian banks and to interest rates in this country? Thank you. Pleasure. Um, so Eric's question is, uh, it, with QE, what, what happens? He's saying a lot of that money is coming to Australia, which is very true in terms of, you know, we've got the sovereign rates, we've got the banks borrowing money, so we've got offshore investors buying. And, and so what will happen to both the levels of bonds, what's the return on bonds when QE stops, and, and generally the Australian banking sector being such a big borrower of, um, of money from overseas. How do you think that'll play out once the QE starts to kick in? Okay, so I think we'll take the last point first, which is the Australian banking system. So Got it. what we need to understand is that in the last two to three years, the Aussie banks have, have radically changed their balance sheets. Radically, off the charts. So to combat just the sorts of issues yeah. that Eric is concerned about. In the old days, yes, the Aussie banks used to borrow quite aggressively from overseas wholesale term funding yep. in non-Australian dollars. Yep. Uh, now, balance sheets now for the Aussie banks are, have a much higher skew towards locally sourced deposits, which are a lot stickier. They don't present any systemic risks. So, Eric, and, um, just, to yeah, into, sorry, just to give you an example, Eric, what, what um, Nick is talking about is all that hybrid issuance. If you have all these hybrids, which we've had billions over the last couple of years, that's a, an area where they've come to you, the investor. So, sorry. Yeah, so, so um, the banks today, when we speak to, to treasurers, they are not using wholesale borrowing to fund their lending growth at all. All yeah. new lending is being funded from deposits. Yeah. So the, the worrying uh, uh, scenario of a bank suddenly coming up with 10 billion it needs to refinance and going overseas to find that uh, is a, a far lower probability today because the banks have been very, very conscious of that. So we don't see that as a big concern at all. The, the Aussie banks are world leaders in the 
level of capitalization uh, and in their liquidity profile. So that's the first point. So the fir the the the, um, the other uh, angle was on you know some of the side effects of QE. What does that mean? Well, um, the the degree of bond buying that the Federal Reserve has been doing and other central banks yep. as well. We've got yep. the Bank of England, England Bank of yep. Japan, ECB. The idea is to squash down term borrowing costs yep. because already your overnight borrowing cost is essentially at zero. Yep. What do you do next? Well, I have to squash down yields further out in the, the yield curve. Yep. So that's what they've been doing. Now, the removal of QE is, is not the Federal Reserve selling all these assets, bear in mind. Yeah. Okay, It's the Federal Reserve ceasing to purchase. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what you have to bear in mind. So yes, yields up. Is it a cataclysm? No. And we're not concerned about the Aussie Bank's wholesale funding. Perfect. Now Raj, you've got a question from Melbourne. Raj, how can we help you? And we've got two minutes to go. It's going to go to Sue. Hi oh, Raj, how can we help you? Uh, I think Raj's question was the fact that he wanted to know how you get income. He normally buys um, equities mm -hmm. and he said, where would I go to get income out of fixed income? And so if you, I can give you 30 seconds soon. Okay, well Raj, plain and simple, uh, think of a, a dividend in, in the case of your equities. What you get in bond world is a coupon. You typically get that every six months and when you buy the bond if it's a fixed rate bond which is the the majority of bonds in the world it the the coupon that you get is known and it's fixed at the end of the life of the bond what you get is the principal of the bond back and so basically as Nick said earlier there is very little upside in investing in bonds what you're um, expecting is a regular income that will occur every six months um, and also at the end of the life of the bond what you're hoping to get back is the amount of money that you've invested and the thing that for Raj is that he, he knows in advance what it is. He knows exactly. if he buys that bond he's going to get $1,200 every quarter or whatever it might be. So yes. he, he's pretty much covered. Um, so thank you to Eric and Raj uh, for calling through and thank you for the caller on uh, on um, Multiplex. It was great. Mm -hmm. Um, but we will have to leave it there. Thank you both for coming on. Nick and Sue, it's been you. great. Great <laughs> smile. We love that. Uh, and to all the viewers, thank you for, look, for watching. Um, we'll see you next week for Bonds versus Equities. All the best. Enjoy your weekend. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.